History of the Sanctuary of Pompeii by Blessed Bartolo Longo Printed at the Valais de Pompeii Editing School of Typography of Bartolo Longo 1895 Introduction Having received from heaven not one, but innumerable benefits, and not least among these, that of a life preserved, through the intercession of our great mother, whom we venerate in Pompeii by her title of the Rosary, I could not fail to realize my great debt of gratitude, and I felt my heart burn with an immense desire to love and praise Mary, and lead others also to love and praise her. From the very moment that this loving mother showed herself so merciful unto me, it became my firm purpose to consecrate my life to her service, and to the propagation of her worship, especially of the divine rosary, so acceptable unto her. Hence arose my intention of spending nearly five hundred francs of my own to raise a simple altar on this abandoned plain around which to gather the simple country folk in order to instruct them in the re recital of the rosary. The events I ha have surpassed my intention. It was only when I beheld the blessing of God descending so abundantly upon my humble efforts that I first planned to raise a throne to Our Lady of such beauty and religious attractiveness as to draw the faithful here to venerate her on the spot. Nor yet could I oppose any obstacle to the designs of the Lord, when suddenly I found myself in the midst of such unusual and prodigious events that it was simply impossible for me to explain. And when, day after day, I received letters bearing testimony to the benefits received, telling of a health, a health miraculously recuperated and of innumerable and extraordinary graces bestowed at the invocation of the Virgin of Pompeii. It appeared to me that there was no better way to choose than to second what Providence itself was working out and what it has done, everyone sees. But in order that even those who are distance, and cannot themselves come to Valley de Pompeii to behold the great works of the Lord, may join together with us to exalt our mother, and to invoke her aid with faith and efficacy, I have had to go a step further, namely, I have been obliged to reach the determination to render her a still greater honor by narrating the various facts, some of them mayhap very significant in the eyes of the world, which, containing in themselves, as they do the germ of a development superior to any human provision, have been the origin of events of a most extraordinary nature. But not only have I wished to narrate them with that consciousness, veracity, and exactness required by history, precisely as persons worthy of belief have referred them to us, and as we have beheld them with our own eyes, but I have also wished to study them deeply, knowing as well as I do that the works of God, in their eloquent language, are at once simple and profound. And here I find it my duty to confess that in the study of these facts I have found a link, a superior principle, an agent of infinite perfection, which connects and binds them, a starting point on which, as Dante Alighieri says, heaven and all nature do depend. This truth I have sought to instill in the minds of my readers, and it appears to me that a history of the sanctuary of Pompeii, written with this criterion, 
must answer the demands not only of those who read to satisfy their religious appetite, admiring the works of God, but also of those believers who still feel the need of an accurate research of the truth in order to glorify him. Certainly, if one considered the incessant stream of visitors of all classes and conditions, of pilgrims, of men of note, of bishops and of those high in authority in the church and state, of entire religious communities, who undertake long journeys from all points of the compass to come and pray before an altar raised on a spot wholly unknown fifteen years ago. In fact, dreaded until a short while since by travelers as a resort of thieves and vagabonds, and now changed suddenly into a renowned sanctuary. If one behold the vast edifice here raised by the faith of so many peoples of diverse tongues, and that will cost no less than two millions, one cannot help being struck by a profound admi admiration and stimulated not only to examine the proofs of all supernatural events adduced, but also to investigate in what manner and by which logical connection of, th of things and ideas this faith has become spread abroad on all sides. How has this thing come to pass? How came such a fact to be possible in our nineteenth century, in which the broad and sincere faith of the Middle Ages has no hold? This is a question that will be put by many. To answer it, I have not felt the need of allowing myself to be guided by too impetuous a zeal, much less by that certain fanaticism of which oftentimes prejudiced and overclouded minds accuse Catholic writers. But I have with a cool and accurate disquisition, strengthened by testimonies and by the evidence of facts and of faith, narrated that which every man who does not willfully desire to deny the light that triumphantly appears must in good conscience affirm with sure servants and this I have done without aught adding or aught hiding, but simply followed the pure and full truth. The Duke of St. Simon was wont to say that when he wrote, he shut his door to men and told a story that was to be confided in, uh, to a century later. I have written these pages in my little study, situated on the first room contiguous to the sanctuary of our beloved mother of Pompeii, from this room I behold the summit of Mount Garo, and made memorable by the apparition of the arch archangel St. Michael to St. Catello, bishop of Castellamare. In the silence that reigns in winter time in this valley, it has oftentimes seemed to me that I was alone in the midst of a de desert world, and at the sight of a lovely azure sky above me, and at the contemplation of that mount which constantly recalls to my mind the celestial apparition and the angelic colloquy, it has seemed to me, while writing, that I, too, far from speaking to mortals of this earth, was conversing with beings who soar through the infinitude of space. To them have I concluded or confided my simple tale, and thus do I give it to the press. Every lover of truth will find means to convince himself of its presence here. I have quoted names, domiciles, and witnesses, because as the persons are yet living, they may be questioned. And so the reader, having thus convinced himself of the veracity of my recital, will also bear te testimony to the truth. And for this reason I am sure that the history of the sanctuary of Pompeii will find two species of contradictors. 
The first will be that of the skeptics, or free thinkers, who, hearing a history interwoven with mir miracles and supernatural events, will shrug their shoulders and smile derisively, and laugh at our own credulity, which they will term superstition, and so will, with a very easy and convenient method, deny everything. With such as these we will undertake no reasoning or dispute, as their manner of getting out of a difficulty is by systematically denying everything. Instead we invite them, not to read this history, but to come to Valley de Pompeii, and there will have to believe their own eyes. In fact, several have come, have seen, and have believed in a divine providence that regulates events in this spot in a matter wholly supernatural. The other class of contradict contradictors is that composed of Christians, or rather of false Christians, who enjoy contradicting sometimes because of their frivolity and sometimes because of incapable of governing their love of slander, and forgetting the great saying of the Redeemer, Judge not that ye be not judged, often pronounced to the most inconsiderate verdicts, often producing a great, great harm than they themselves suspected. This is a class much to be feared, as they appear to speak for the love of truth. But this class is complex, those who speak in good faith either oppose or curse the work of God because they hear others in whom they blindly trust to do the same, and without searching for the truth themselves they do as the sheep of whom the poet wrote. And as the one, so too the others do. For such as these, this history will be of use, as it will, at least, serve a more seriously call the attention of their conscience and of their judgment of his work, and move them to see and examine if what we state is true. Those of bad faith belong to the evil seed of Judah and to the priests of the old law who killed Jesus, thinking thus to do such a thing, that would be pleasing in the sight of God. For these there is no other hope than the mercy of Mary to enlighten and convert them, and for these, too, do we pray. Book First The Ancient Valley of Pompeii Chapter One Ancient and Modern Pompeii The traveler who wishes, in the space of a few hours, to visit the sanctuary that rises in honor of the Virgin of the Rosary, on this piece of heaven fallen to earth, as the poets called this Paravesuvian zone, but to present himself at the station of Naples and ask for a return ticket for Valley de Pompeii, the next stopping place after Pompeii. The whole trip takes but sixty-five minutes. What a delightful road! The beautiful sea, as clear and blue as the sky it reflects, is never lost sight of during the whole trip, and it lies rippling and dazzling to the right of the railroad track. First he passes along the open, broad sea beach, after which he leaves to the left, smiling, Portici, Resina, the ancient Hieracunum, and Oplanto, once sisters in mourning to Stabia and to Pompeii, over which, like a giant on guard, ever towers grand old Vesuvius, with his high crest of smoke. To the right his eye wanders across the broad gulf, even further, ever further, till, 
arrested by the mountains that rear themselves immediately behind the Castle Mare. Then, slowly shifting his gaze towards the poetical shores of fair Sorrento, that ever recall to mind the sweet singer of the Goffredo, immortal Tasso, he beholds, long uh, lost in the blue azure of the distance, as though hung between sea and sky, Point Minerva. But already the scene has changed. Torre del Greco, the city of corals, twelve times rebuilt by its inhabitants who have ever perstinaciously returned to the ruins of their city covered by the lava of Vesuvius, obstinate enemy of spirits still more obstinate. An obstinate enemy of spirits, still more obstinate in the love of their native soil, has been passed on the left. So too has Torre Enunciata, flourishing in its commerce and industries left behind. The train now stops at the station of ancient Pompeii, but the valley of the sanctuary has not been reached. As yet, though the traveller is wholly intent on going directly to venerate the great mother of God in her monumental temple, nevertheless, hearing the conductor call out, Pompeii, he almost unconsciously looks out of the window. A thousand indistinct, confused ideas of antiquity, of history, of paganism, and of ruin rush simultaneously to his mind. Pompeii, magic, historical word, that attracts the attention and the study of all Earth's cultured men. Pompeii, splendid and majestic among all the Etruscan cities that vaunted Capua, for their metropolis. Seneca and Tacitus, Florus and Titus Livius, called her fair and flourishing because of the beauty of her sky, the activity of her commerce, and the importance of her communications. Softly reclining on velvet hills, she rested her head on the side of a mountain of fire, fountains of pure water flowing forth from the Sarno, refreshed her bosom and at her feet, in a calm repose, lay the smiling gardens, with the, inf with the fertile plains irrigated by the waters of that historic river, in those days navigable. But that mountain vomited devouring flames, destruction rained and poured from its heaving, its heaving sides, burying every grandeur in its train, and over that immense he hecticome, like a f funeral pall, was thrown a sheet of ashes. The traveller sees but a huge mound of earth and lapile, once that once buried a whole generation of living beings beneath their pitiless weight and, scarce noticing that the train is already moving along, he gazes on the long stretch of walls of roofless and ruined dwellings, sees columns, some still entire and standing, others broken and fallen, pass rapidly before his view. Intermingled with the remains of a broken vaults and the ruins of painted walls, till he sights the amphitheatre, once giving over to the spectacle of human butcheries. Unconsciously his brows contract, in almost unknown to himself he has become sad and pensive. His thoughts have reverted back to the life, habits, and habituations of a people long since distinct. Roman specters seem to wander about those heights. From the contemplation of those stones, Still standing after a lapse of eighteen centuries, his imagination descends to the deserted streets, to that intricate web of long, narrow, melancholy alleys. There is still 
the road paved with Vesuvian stones shaped like trapezoids. There still the cobblestone sidewalk. There still the marks of the heavy carts and vehicles upon the pavements. The houses and the shops, the edifices and vast temples still seem to await the return of their masters. The fountains and statues, the painting and the exercise grounds for a aristocratic youth, the tombs, the mosaics, porticos, theaters, and amphitheater, all speak of the Roman grandeur. But the masters returned no more. All that splendid came to an end. That pagan grandeur did not go beyond the tomb, and, so, and not did it know that the future destinies of the human race. Mute are the forum, the public baths, and the temple of Apollo. Mute the pantheon, the temple of Augustus, the two theaters and the vast amphitheater. Eighteen centuries of silence lay heavily on them. Five minutes have not passed and the sharp whistle of the locomotive reminds the traveler that he has left the station of Pompeii, that there is no more, and is approaching that of the Pompeii which is rising. The scene, as if by enchantment, has changed. A svelte and elegant cupola appears a long way off. After the cupola, brilliant with light and displaying its variegated white and black checks, appear an immense building, distending itself. along the side of the sanctuary, then in front came other minor edifices, still the eye traveling further and further on, behold, on beholds a straight road, an avenue shaded by a quadruple row of plantains and eucalyptus that started from a marble column, a milestone, that bears the legend Via Sacra, and now, finally, has reached the station of Valle di Pompeii. His foot scarcely touched the ground before the solemn sound of a bell reached his ear. Those slow vibrations, resounding through the valley, extend the tremolo of their sonorous waves of sound far into the desert streets of the mute city. The Christian's heart can scarcely repress its vehement palpitations at such new and unexpected impressions. By the side of a land of death he has suddenly come upon a land of resurrection and of life. Instead of an amphitheater stained with blood, he beholds a temple alive with the faith and love, a temple sacred to the mother maid. Opposite a city, dead in pagan debauchery, throbs a new chaste and noble life that takes its origin from the new civilization, that takes its origin from the new civilization introduced by Christianity. The new Pompeii, the eighteen centuries of silence hovered over those tombs, are broken by the sacred toll and the secular melancholy of that spot is gladdened by the tender song of children, by the little orphans of the rosary who from within the pale of a sacred, sacred ark praise the Lord. It is the new civilization by the side of the old modern art, by the side of the ancient. That is here clearly to be observed. Christianity, the source of life, face to face with paganism, whose sun has set forever. But this singular confrontation of life and death on the self-same so soil becomes still more evident as soon as the threshold of the sanctuary has been crossed. 
Here the glory of modern Christian and Italian painting and sculpture shines forth in its full splendor. Those colored marbles of perfect workmanship, of incomparable hue and luster, those frescoes of the cupola, of the apsis, and of the entire ceiling of the sanctuary, the angels that form a crown around the upper part of the church, those finely worked statues of bronze and marble, that wealth of gliding through the vast edifice, that wondrous softness of tints, that perfection of Christian art in its purely Tuscan style, all these are eloquent voices that loudly speak to the heart of the traveler and to the mind of every lover of arts and the religion of saying, here the new art has succeeded to the old, the new civilization has supplanted the ancient, here Christianity triumphs over paganism. All this great movement of life and art of civilization and re religion do not exist here eleven years ago. All this splendid, all this splendor that bursts on the sight of the visitor is like a sweet vision after the dark and melancholy thoughts of death and ruin had no existence but a few years ago. And here the traveler will want to know how so rapid a change that must be of a necessity seems an, seem an exaggeration to the distance and appears as a dream even to those who are present came to pass. To satisfy this just desire I must however begin far back and to reveal the earliest origin of this great phenomenon. But prior to the beginning of these researches it appears to me wise and reasonable to permit a few truths that will place my narrative in a more evident light. 1. The work of Pompeii is the work of God. The Virgin Mary is directing it to his glory. And the means of promulgation of which she avails herself are miracles. In this work is hidden a profound and secret design of God, not yet fully developed. And when God wills a thing, be men willing or not, it is sure to be accomplished. This much we can asservate, without fear of erring, that surely it is a design of mercy. However, we must confess that we ourselves are at first mistaken because of our lack of understanding of the divine signs. We thought in the beginning that they were but designs of mercy to be shown to the poor country folk of this valley, and we blindly followed the impulse that we felt within us to instruct and benefit merely the ignorant people of the country roundabout. But with the lapse of years, with the unceasing multiplying of the prodigies of our heavenly queen, with the centuplication of letters and of foreigners and of strangers from the most remote regions of the world, return to us either to thank the Virgin for benefits received, or to ask for new favors. With the coming hither of so many illustrious personages, and church and the state authorities, so that oftentimes our shoulders can scarce bear so heavy a load, and still we behold a constant increase, a steady progress, we have at last become aware of the fact that God's design is one of mercy, yes, but not of partial, but of universal mercy. If the work of Pompeii is the work of God, it must needs be constantly opposed. The gospel comforts us and teaches us that our Redeemer was the first to be placed as a sign that should be contradicted. Signum in quo contradicitur. 
Contradiction is the distinguishing sign of all his works. This is the surest sign that your work is, is the work of God. Thus spake to us one day the greatest personages of our times, the high pontiff Leo the Thirteenth, because you suffer contradiction, but the Virgin will cause your work to triumph. And in fact, as will be seen by this history, there has not been a triumph of the sanctuary that was not preceded by a battle, nor a glory not preceded by a humiliation. Thus will our reader see how constantly all our great consolations have only come after great bitterness, and that in all our arduous trials we have been sustained and lengthened by the loving hand of the mistress of his valley, whose title is the Queen of Victories. 3. In this work of Pompeii, providence inconvertibly manifests itself, that providence so often denied or cursed in these days. Without any sure income, without any surplus, without any fixed capital, without any help from city or state government, thousands of francs are spent weekly, and hundreds of families, workmen, children, and orphans are daily supported. On Saturday evening, not a cent remains, but on the following Saturday the money is there, ready and forthcoming, and this has been going on for twelve years, and we have in this matter succeeded in dispersing more than three million francs. Who can doubt that there exists a providence? 4. From facts in which I myself have either been an actor, or which I have been and still am a witness, as I will show, it will be easy for everyone to conclude that there is not a sinner so lost, but that he may find safety in the rosary of Mary. There is not a soul, however bound and chained by Satan, that cannot break loose from its bonds. By holding on to that chain of refuge, which the Queen of Heaven extends from above for the salvation of, of the shipwrecked in life's tempestuous sea. 5. To triumphantly carry on even the most difficult and arduous works undertaken for the honor of God, there is no need either of riches, of power, or of wisdom. When all things are done as ordained, and with sincere faith, for all the rest one thing alone, that draws from heaven the full abundance of superhuman health, it is necessary, and that is, a right intention. Chapter 2 the Ancient Valley of Pompeii 1. The Unexplored Valley Prior to beginning this historical narrative, it seems to me to be a wise plan to premit a few notice regarding the spot where the events chronicled in the sketch that, I have, that have taken place. If the building of a new city, and of a monumental temple, erected in the shortest possible time in an open and abandoned country, like that, that like a magnet attracts the heart of so many inhabitants of this globe, is a remarkable fact. Then, too, is it important to know what this spot, chosen by Providence, in this century of ours, so prone to deny providence, as the theatres of its portents was in times gone by, and what is what it is today, now that the Queen of Angels has chosen it as the seat of her throne of mercies. Whosoever comes from the amphitheatre of Pompeii continues on his way towards Scafati, 
and lets his eyes roam over the surrounding country. A most beautiful valley presents itself. This valley, lying to the southward of Mount Vesuvius, is irrigated to the right and to the left by two rivers, the Sarno and the Can Canal of the Sarno, and, fertile and rich in various annual productions, it lies smiling for many miles round about the solitary ruins. A long chain of mountains, a spur projecting from the Apennines, for, for about east to west a broad and ample belt round about. They are the same mountains that hedge in the valley of the Sarno, lengthening themselves out towards Almalfi, and then finishing the circle tower around, uh, towards the south, above Castellamare di Stabia, till with a long arm they can stretch themselves down to the sea at the point of Sorrento, or as it is awful called, the point of the Campanella. Thus crowned by her mountains, covered for the most part with luxuriant and vegetation of oil and of chestnut trees, and brimming over with life teeming in numberless beautiful villages that nestle on their summits or their slopes, this valley reposes proudly between two neighboring mountains that give her renown and historic fame. These are, to the north, Vesuvius, that with its menacing crater and rough, rugged sides, stands directly over her like a lord and master, and Mount Garo to the south, that, with its three dark peaks, covered with fruit-bearing woods and olive trees, watches over her like a protector or a sentinel on guard. This spot, today strewn with farmhouses, buildings, and villas, that day by day, in increasing numbers, cluster around the growing sanctuary of the Rosary, numbered at the beginning of the present century but a few souls, and today, thanks to the movement of life and art, all of which the rising temple and the works instituted by us are the origin, it numbers more than three thousand. This valley has today become famous, not through the antiquity of the joyed, destroyed pagan city, or the number of visitors curious to behold ancient monuments, but in truth through the marvels here done by the Blessed Virgin, by means of her new temple dedicated to the Rosary, and through the concourse of numberless Ill illustrious pilgrims who flock hither from every city and every clime to venerate her who is the queen of graces and of mercies and consoler of the inflicted. But what was once this valley that today has become the center of the affection of hundreds of thousands of faithful? What was its name in bygone days? What is what its history in the days of false and lying gods? During the course of all the centuries that have elapsed since the year of our Lord, 79, year in which Pompeii was destroyed, to the present day, that which we now call Valley of Pompeii was unknown, or we had perhaps better say, unexplored. Even in the writings of the learned we find no mention of it. Should one of our readers even today question students of antiquity and ask them, what became of the country lying to the east and south of ancient Pompeii after the year 79? Whether we went the dispersed Pompeian 
after the day of the fatal destruction of their beloved city? Their answer would be, it's hard to say. The fact is, no one could ever have imagined that this obscure, unknown, and unstudied valley had been so called ever since the remotest antiquity, and that the name it, to, the name it today bears of Valle de Pompeii as its own right by historic. Who could ever have supposed that this abandoned spot, chosen by Mary as the center of her portents in this nineteenth century, could have had the historical importance it did, not only in the time when ancient Pompeii was at the height of its glory, but also in the middle centuries, from the eleventh to the seventeenth. We have therefore been doubly fortunate. We have given birth with, new, with a new sanctuary raised in honor of the Queen of the Rosary to a new town that may become the new Pompeii. Not only, but we also have found the key that unlocks the door to a better knowledge of the historical importance of this valley dear to Mary. The way we came to make this important discovery was very simple. In 1887, in order to prepare for the triumph of the Blessed Virgin in this valley, on that ever-memorable day of the 8th of May, day in which she was to take possession of her throne in Pompeii, we not only built, on ground belonging to us, a small station, bearing the name of Valle di Pompeii for the greater convenience of all visitors to this sanctuary. We not only opened through the fields of the Di Fusco family an avenue leading from said station to the sanctuary, a avenue which we call Via Sacra, but we also, at the own expense made a square and one extremity of which we began to dig the foundations of a model modern workingman's home when lo and behold whilst digging the foundations some ruins appear proceeding carefully the neighbors came upon ancient rooms and upon monuments of the pompeian epoch These having been studied by the famous archaeologist Ludovico Pepe were the cause of his writings the history of this valley from the first century of the Christian era up to the present day. And this, his history, is enriched and sustained by the incontrovertible documents found by rummaging among the old parchments hidden in the diocesan archives as well as those of the various libraries and notorial files. Following, therefore, the revelations afforded by the monuments discovered by us, and the studious and learned researchers brilliantly concluded by the very distinguished archaeologist Ludovico Pepe, we are glad to offer to the reader of the history of the sanctuary of Pompeii a brief epilogue of eighteen centuries of history in this valley, till yesterday abandoned and forgotten by all, but chosen by providence unto the glory of the Virgin for the moral and civil resurrection of this Pompeian people, and for the increase and spread of faith so rapidly decreasing in the world. 2. The Ancient Valley in the First Century What was the Valley of Pompeii in these days in which pagan Pompeii flourished? The valley we, call, we today call Valley of Pompeii was in the times of the ancient city called Campus Pompeianus. It was crossed by roads that from Pompeii led to Stabia, to Nocera, and to other 
important towns in the valley of the Sarno, and it was also in intersected by roads that from this spot led to the above city named cities. For this reason, besides all agricultural, city industries also could freely prosper here. Rustic villas, manufactories, and shops adorned the outlying country, rich in luxuriant vegetation. But what was the state of this valley after the eruption? When the city and its surroundings had been buried beneath the ashes and lapilli, and all around remained mute and desolate, a ray of life appeared on the spot nearest the amphitheater, on the very site of our ex excavations, that we began on the western side of a large square we opened in New Pompeii. Here, on top of the ancient monuments, we found the tombs of those who had lived there after the eruption. These tombs we found excavated in the ashes, and built on the Lapile, erupted in the year 79. They are tombs for the poor, prepared without show, and proving that those who built them were obliged to content themselves with what they could get. They are pagan tombs. In them were found the ointment boxes, the lamps placed at the feet of the body, all of which objects we have collected and preserved. The constructions which we found built on top of the ancient ones are the work of the new inhabitants of the valley. A still more evident indication of the important discovery was a piece of brass money of the Emperor Diocletian, found in a room built against some ancient walls that belonged to an epoch greatly anterior to the eruption. The Roman Emperor Diocletian lived in the third century, therefore the occupants of this house must have lived there at least until the fourth century as we have found monuments belonging to that century that most evidently prove the valley to have been inhabited. We again find this valley mentioned in the ninth century by the name of Campus Pompeianus by the chronicle Martino Monaco, who in the history of the transfer of the body of St. Bartholomew from Lepare to Benevento, tells that Sicardo, prince of Benevito, for fear that the Saracens might attempt a disembarkment, had encamped his army, anno 838, in Pompeo Campo, quia Pompeia urbe campanae nunc deserta Norman accepted. Campus Pompeianus, it was therefore called in the ninth century, from the name of the destroyed city of Pompeii in Campania. At any rate, whether the Campo or the Valley, it takes its name from Pompeia. It may be for this reason that the old curate of Valle, Don Giovanni Cirillo, who had died within the last year, took for the motto to be engraven on his seal the words, Parish of the Most Holy Savior in the ancient land of Valle a Pompeia, as we will narrate. 3. The Sacred Valley the first Pompeian Christians. Here, very naturally, one's curiosity might be aroused to know whether among the first inhabitants of Valais de Pompeii there were any converts to the Christian faith. We will satisfy this, this desire by stating that in the ancient city was not even the slightest vestige of Christianity found and that, for this reason, the valley of Pompeii, inhabited by an idolatrous Pompeian fugitives, 
remained for a long time in the darkness of paganism. The ray of new civilization that had together with the Christianity penetrated Naples and Rome and nearly all Italy, watered by the blood of martyrs, was very late in illumining the minds of the descendants of that city, so famous for its luxury and gentile voluptuousness, and whose ruins to this day bear the impress of dissoluteness and depravity. We must reach the fourth century in order to find the first traces of Christianity in Pompeii. It is true that in the excavations of Pompeii there was found a lamp with a sign of the cross. But Father Yarucci of the Jesuits, in his Pompeian questions, recognized that cross-signed lamp certainly distinguishing a feature of the fourth century, that is to say of those same inhabitants whom Fiorelli and all archaeologists declare to belong to the third and fourth centuries. These inhabitants were wont to go and dig within the ruins of ancient Pompeii, and by making apertures in the upper part of the houses, they entered them and carried off anything of value. Some of them, however, after, being, after having penetrated through the apertures, remained buried within and were suffocated by the falling of lapillae and of ruins. Thus is explained the presence of a Christian lamp in the fourth century among the excavations of Pompeii. Neither have we found in the vast ed edifice brought to light by us any trace of Christianity. But certainly those same Christians of the, third cent the fourth century who inhabited that part of the valley excavated by us were the progenitors of those Pompeians who built the church of the Most Holy Savior on the banks of the river Sarno not quite a mile distant from the unearthed Fulot, Fulonicie. The first time we find the church mentioned by any writer is in the year 1093. It can therefore with safety be asserted that after the destruction of Pompeii a hamlet was built in the underlying valley and along the banks of the river Sarno. In those days navigable, and this hamlet, taking its name from the situation in which it was built, that is, in the lower part along the river, was called Valais, and here a church in honor of the Most Holy Savior was erected. Around this church there dispersed inhabitants of all the valley gathered, and thus formed the new city. According to the principles of the philosophy of history given to us by Vico, of the flux and reflux of generations and of various epochs, we would call to the notice of the reader a singular fact that, as the formation of the city of Valais was begun by the building of a church around which the first inhabitants gathered, so in this our century, around the Church of the Rosary, the scattered dwellers in the modern valley are clustering, thus to form a new city. And if the sanctuary that today rises in our midst is of great importance, even socially, considered, of no less importance was the Church of the new Pompeian Christians. In fact, it is to be seen, according to Pepe, that in 1093 the ancient church of Valais became an abbey, it having been given by the bishop of Nola, Sasson, to Hugo, abbot of the Be Benedictine months of Aversia. In 1215 we find it mentioned in the brief in Eminente Apolloriste Sedis of the High Pontiff Innocent the Third, 
From this we learn that the Abbey of Valle was extended from the sea to Vesuvius and to the east as far as the Sarno. It was in 1337 that this rich Abbey Church of Valle in the Campus Pomponeus became poor and dowerless. Then those same Benedictine months of Aversa seated the church and the town of Valle and the property of the church of Bernardo Caracciolo in permutation, which possessions from that day formed the feud of the noble family of the Caracciolo of neighbors, Naples. Caracciolo enjoyed the benefit of these possessions but the church became exceedingly impoverished, whence the citizens of the University of Valle in the 16th century decided to endow it, but from that time it re-entered the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Nola. However, the ancient citizens of Valle, as far back as 1511, thus acquired the so-called right of patronage, which was to present to the Bishop of Nola the nominee for the pastorship. Even to this day the parish of the Most Holy Saviour in Valle di Pompeii is one of the only eighteen parishes in Italy in which the right of electing a pastor by the voice of the people is in full vigour. What a singular valley this is! Pepe, however, had good reason to doubt the authenticity of the bull of Julius the Second, of the year 1511, which, with which this right of popular election is conferred for the first time, and that to the people of Valle. He sus suspects it to be apocryphal, as he had not yet been able to find in the archives of Rome the said bull not even among such of them as are printed. Moreover, he finds it to be identical to another bull sent to the citizens of Bologna. But we commit the, the care of the research as to the truth in this matter, to the diocesan authority, a watchful guardian of all ecclesiastical rights. Four. The Valley of Pompeii, the theater of war in the Middle Ages. The land of Valle is mentioned in the Middle Ages not only because of its church, as we have seen, but also because of its castle, f feud, and township, with its municipality or university, and with its mayors. From documents found in the Grand Archives of Naples, in the National Library of the same city, and with the important archives of the Episcopal See of Nola, where the accounts of holy visits made by pastors in those times still preserved, it is clear to see that the township of Valle was well inhabited and guarded by a castle more important than the one of Scafati, and in occasion of the historical conspiracy of the barons, promoted by the Prince of Taranto against Ferdinand I of Aragon, this valley rises into importance. Not far distant from here, near the town of Sarno, Ferdinand came to battle with the Anjon forces, and they were strengthened by the troops of the conspiring barons. The famous defeat of Sarno fell to the lot of Ferdinand. The following day, as is known in history, the Anjoin army went to Castellamare di Stabia, passing through our territory of Valle. Meanwhile, it came to pass that in the year 1459 
Louis Caracciolo, the great feudal lord of our valley, took the side of the barons in the famous conspiracy. But Ferdinand, protected by Pope Pius II, a Piccolomini, Piccolomini and coadjuvated by Anthony Piccolomini, a nephew of the Pope, routed the army of the barons, took the rebellious Louis Caracciolo prisoner, pardoned him his life, but took from him the feud of the valley, which he gave to his faithful Toraldo. In 1550 the views the feud of the valley was by Toraldo sold to Jacob of the Bucci's, from whose hands it passed into those of Alphonse Piccolomini, who bought the entire feud of valet, that is, the castle, the houses, the palace of the university, the men, the vassals, and all the feud feudal rights, whence later he received the title of Prince of Valle. Because of these things our valley was in 1647 elevated to the dignity of a principality, 